quite uh, quite okay yesterday. No, today is grandma's day, so I celebrated a little bit. Yes, me too. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> we don't have grandma's day here, so oh, <laughs> just oh. a regular Sunday for me. Uh, but today we're not talking about grandma, we're talking about education, yeah. Because yeah, it's, exactly. it's our January challenge to record a podcast about education. We still need to come out with a name, but maybe going to do an intro here, like intro and it's going to be like a podcast. But we will With music. <laughs> With music, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to get, ask you guys first, why do you think like education is so important, so significant globally? Do you have any ideas? I, I think it's because it can open a variety of opportunities that you would not be able to have otherwise without it. Uh, without education, you're going to have people at a disadvantage um, because you have that knowledge that allows you to do things that you want to. For example, we're not able to become the jobs that we want to if we don't have access to the education. Yeah, yes, I, I also think that it is important because just as Alex said, uh, our world can't improve without education. Education is like so significant uh, because our it just makes our world improve and develop in many areas. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you guys completely. I also wanted to add, when I was thinking about it, that, for example, it's also a safe space, for example, for children who live with like parents who, um, I don't know, like in a in a way pathologic uh, families. It's sometimes also a place, only place in like developing countries where the children uh, in the school, they get food. That's the only place they can get that. So um, as you said, it also gives us opportunities, but also it's like a safe space. I think we, it's also the place we meet our friends sometimes even for life. Uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's that's how it goes. Yes, also yeah, education I agree. is a big, uh, big part of uh, financial supports of the world, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Okay, so uh, now, now I want to go with another question, which is how accessible is education globally? Is this equal for everyone? Oh, I can go, I can go first. Um, I was researching a bit about it also, and I found that uh, in the Convention on the Rights of Children, um, there is uh, there are two articles which mention education, uh, and it says on paper that um, primary education should be compulsory and available for all, and that every uh, state that w w like signed under uh, the convention should um, give access to education for everyone. However, I think that in reali reality, it's not like that. It's not that easy. I think a lot of uh, people still uh, are not educated, weren't educated in the past. And for example, a lot of children also work instead of getting educated because of uh, some problems or like that they have to work so so it depends so for sure it's it's uh, it's accessible it should be accessible but I think it's not equal for everyone this access it's not equal for everyone yes I also think that it is a big deal when it comes to uh, like kidnapping some people and a black market where people are not even registered uh in a like government system and they do not have access to education just because they are not registered in um in in the country that they live in yeah yeah i so think i think do i want to say something alex or should we go to the next question <laughs> <coughs> sorry um yes i was also going to mention that uh we have to consider even children who do have access to education might not always have access to high quality education. Um, there's a statistic that an estimated 250 million children worldwide are not learning to read or write despite them being in school. So there's accessibility to education and then there's accessibility to 
sufficient education. I think that also should be considered. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Especially that we are in the place in the world right now where almost everywhere uh, there is education. And that's it's our also our next question. Should primary education be compulsory and where is it like now? I found that uh, education overall, like uh, is there are education compulsory education laws everywhere in the world except Bhutan, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vatican City. So um, there are these few countries, and also like in in most countries there is like ten uh, to twelve years uh, of education. Sometimes there is even more than twenty years of compulsory education. But also in some countries, there is only seven to nine years compulsory education. And even in some countries, there is less than seven years uh, education. But um, what do you think, guys? Should, uh, like, why is it so maybe important that we have this private education and that it is compulsory right now? I, I think, think that, that... <laughs> okay, <Sorry. laughs> you should start. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, I think that primary education should be compulsory because you have, you're able to not only provide children with fundamental knowledge, and it is easier easier for children to learn things than adults are. You're not only providing them with this knowledge, you're also providing them access to a social environment where they're able to uh, develop their social skills and make friends and socialize with people they wouldn't usually be able to. So not only is there education that they would be missing out on that is highly important, but there's also the social aspect. Yes, that's what I was going to say. But I also want to add uh, that primary education is so important because in our early um, years, we just want to encourage child and uh, just encourage them to do something more and uh, maybe choose a path uh, of their own lives. I'm not talking about specifically, but I'm talking about encouraging them to do something more than just um, maybe work in a family business or on a farm or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. And it's also, I think it's like, as I said before, it's a safe space for children, for example, if they have any problems with the family, if they, uh, for example, are not given food, uh, like teachers in school can see that, maybe they can react. But they are like, it's an extra support for the children. And uh, I think what we are going to also say later that education, it's not also about the curriculum and teaching children. It's also about like teaching them how to live and maybe also be in a different um, environment. Okay, so uh, now I want to uh, go to the other question, which is, what are the most crucial problems regarding education right now? I actually wrote down some of the my thoughts about it, um, which is unequal learning opportunities. As we said, uh, not everyone has access to education or access to high quality education. Uh, another one, which is, I really had to thought about it uh, because I really didn't recognize it as a problem that is so big, but adapting to technological uh, advancements. Uh, it is horrifying that uh, some of the countries in the world do not have uh, resources or books or any other um, help, uh, educational help uh, that we do have. Yeah, I think we we are because we live like in Poland also, and we live you live Alex and live in in Canada, and we are in a privileged situation because we have access to education, and even like I think in some maybe places in Poland it's it's not that good education, but it's compulsory everywhere, and um, also uh, there are some like books because the government provides it but I, as i said in some can in developing countries i don't know maybe uh, maybe in in some places in like uh, in east europe or like uh, 
I think in every country we're gonna find a school which lacks uh uh lacks teachers also. I think that's also a big problem sometimes. Uh, I think also in in our country, uh, lacking teachers, yes. lacking um. Yeah, as uh, as you, Martina said, lacking resources. That's what the what's the biggest, uh, I think, and crucial problems right now. We we have to take care of. But maybe also uh, addressing mental health uh, concerns among students because uh, mental health just puts a huge impact on how we uh, process uh, education and um, on our teaching process. So. Uh, we should just take mental health uh, help in uh, on another level. Yeah, I agree very much. Um, that kind of leads into another question that uh, why is it important to address the mental health and well-being of students? And <coughs> sorry, um, especially considering the impact of academic pressures and social pressures. Uh, so I could start, or you guys could start, or you can you can start. I like that's that's like okay for me. Okay, so um, one thing we could say is that in a survey between twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, university, uh, at least sixty percent of students met the criteria for one or more mental health problem. The impact that stress can have on a student's well being, or constant high academic pressure, as well as low free time due to trying to meet these standards can have a really bad impact on a student's mental health. And I think we also have to consider burnout because especially in the younger grades, you'll have a student with so much potential and who will burn out. And if we can avoid that, we'll have so many more uh, extraordinary students who are able to produce amazing things. So I think if we're able to address more mental health regarding students, we're going to be able to we're going to be able to allow more students to express their creativity to the world. Yeah, I agree with you totally. But I think the problem we we should not like be uh we should not maybe address the consequences of the problem, but the problem itself. So um we should change how the school w w looks like right now. I think there are like new programs which uh, we are doing it, uh, but partially. So first we should focus on the relationship between like children and teachers. We should focus on them being creative and not like loading them with a lot of uh, unuseful stuff in reality, which they're gonna never use, but they should learn it because the system we, we teach right now was created for, I think, soldiers uh, and for factory workers in industry, uh, industrial times, yeah. So that's the way we, that's why we also need to like take care of the mental health because their students are just people and they have problems. And especially with uh, the access to internet right now, to the overwhelming problems are going right now, the school also should be like a safe place where you can um, develop and not like stress out what to do and how to do that and be overloaded. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> I agree too. That's a really good point. Okay. Oh, all right. So I think... It uh, another question that is kind of it's kind of relates to us is what are there some differences between Canadian and Polish programs? I I don't really know how the Canadian program looks like program looks like, uh, but I know that Alex wrote about grading systems in our notes. What how does the grading system looks in Canada in overall? Well, usually we get a percentage grade, so it's you can get anywhere from 0% to 100%. And basically, if you get above 50, you pass the course. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's pretty lenient sometimes, but uh, it also allows people to really try between getting a 90 and 100. That can be really encouraging. <laughs> it yeah. sounds quite hard because in Poland, we do have a grading system that goes from one to six and to have one on the test or exam, you have to get at least 30% and uh, 
no, wait, to have two, you have at least 30%. To have three, you have to get 50%. And then it goes all the way up. So for me, it's crazy that you have to get 50% to just, <laughs> just have a good <laughs> grade. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I think like sometimes the grading system it's it's really weird in Poland but uh, but like for example for me in uh, getting a 6 in uh, my last class of the whole high school it's really hard because for the 6 you have to do something like over more. maybe yeah sometimes something more or like have the opportunity for that uh but um uh, I don't know what what else are the differences. How do you, for example, we have uh, first we have eighth grades of primary school, and then like four or five uh, five grades of uh, high school or technical school. How is it in Canada, Alex? It's pretty cool. We have six grades of elementary. We call it so that'd be like primary school. Yeah. We have three grades of junior high, which is like pre secondary <laughs> and then we have uh three grades of high school which is really cool and then after that it's just university yeah but i think okay. maybe um, it's like pretty similar probably in the curriculum is something completely different uh, yeah. but uh, um but yeah i think there are differences but uh, probably there are also some some similarities you know one similarity Alex, and maybe how does your time schedule look like? Do you go to school um, uh, from like 8 a.m.? Because we in Poland do that mostly. Yes, 8 a.m. to 2.30 is our current schedule. And when you were uh, like a little, it was also like that? Or was it uh, When I was little, it was like 9 to 3.15. So, oh, yeah. that's interesting. I think for yeah. us, it's it really... A lot depends on the school probably also, but um because sometimes there are a lot of children and not so many like placed in the school. Sometimes there are also like morning uh and evening classes in some from high school right now because there are problems with like I think teachers or like schools in some schools. Yes, but the hours are probably different. But yeah, we normally start at eight like for the whole 12 years that's really cool okay so maybe we should go to the next question uh what in your opinion makes a good school hmm i have one answer and i think i'm gonna stick to it to the rest of my life i think teachers good teachers uh make a good school uh, and probably also like, like your classmates, but teachers are the most important thing because if he is a good teacher, if uh, or he or she is a good teacher, you're gonna learn a lot from them, even if they don't have books, even if they don't have some access to something, they're gonna, um, if they care, they're gonna maybe use some extra, uh, like pay with their own money or do something to really. And they have to be really passionate about teaching, so I think that teachers make make a good make a good school, and I think uh, they create when there is a supportive environment created by teacher and student. That's like the best thing. Yes, yeah, I, I agree, agree with, with that. Yeah, I agree with my one hundred one hundred percent. That's also my answer. Okay, so should we go to the next question? Yeah, uh, yeah. sure. Okay, so what roles do exams play in e evaluating educational success? And so what are the disadvantages of tests? So oh. um, I can start. So when, when we consider tests, there's like so many advantages and disadvantages. So a good advantage is it provides preparation for stressful situations that we usually wouldn't have access to. It also gives students a uh, opportunity to assess their knowledge in a course, and it provides an equal opportunity for all students. It's in a controlled environment, it's in a controlled time. Um, then we look at the disadvantages and we have extreme tests of students with students with test anxiety. There's bad days and if everyone has bad days. And if you have a bad day on a test day, 
that can completely tank your grade, which isn't that good. And then stress and time factors can uh, impact students' ability to accurately portray it. So if, you're, if they know all of the information going into a test, the stress or the time might make them forget what they have already learned. Yeah, I think that also, like, as you said, it, um, as you, it said, you said that it gives uh, students an opportunity to assess their knowledge in the course, but sometimes it's only like um, assessing what they know and not their um, skills that they have. Uh, in mathematics, of school to assess skills sometimes, but in other, uh, it's sometimes there are ABC tests, which you can just guess. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, for me, uh, the main advantage of it, for example, of the final exams is that um, everyone writes the same exam. Yeah. But, but um, it's stressful. It's really stressful, especially when every says it's the most important exam of your life uh, or like it can influence uh, in. We have also like exams after eighth grade of primary school uh, or elementary school. <laughs> um, uh, depends how you call it so also it depends how well you write them you can get to a good or uh, wor worse high school so it also like it determines uh i think like there there is like this thinking in students and i think that it determines their whole life and they stress out um so in a way i think we like exams are are good like to assess because like it's also motivation for me my uh, test I write at school it motivates me to learn because without them I I don't know if I would do that <laughs> yeah. yes exactly but I also think that um, for me um, the biggest disadvantage uh, about exams is that sometimes uh, how good you write tests is just your grade and I think it is not motivational for all of us uh, to write to uh, just learn about something, but it is more about getting a grade a grade that we want to get, and we shouldn't use tests and exams as a way of um, just grading all of the students. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. All right, so we can go on to the next question. How does technology influence education? So I said previously that according to UNESCO, only 35%, oh, sorry, I did not say this previously, I was planning to. Um, <laughs> according to UNESCO, only 35% only of secondary schools in what they refer to as least developed countries have access to internet. So we can understand that technology is not accessible everywhere. Um, and that's really interesting because in places that it is accessible, we use it almost, we use it daily. We use it more than we use paper. We complete our assignments online. We use this to access all the study resources. We have access to so many extra resources that we wouldn't have if we'd have technology. So we, so while technology has, <coughs> while technology has a huge influence on education, we need to understand that this can give some students an unfair advantage. So we should work towards getting technology more accessible for all students who want it. Yeah, I think also what's interesting right now, for example, I only like take my laptop to school. That's where my, uh, my notes are. But I think in one of the Scandinavian countries, I don't know if it is Denmark or other country, but they also used computers and like laptops and tablets. And they now they gotten rid of that. They detected. Uh, they made studies that it all it's in the long term it does not help children. That for example, writing something on paper helps them remember it more. And like um, being on laptop, I know that for example, when we are on laptops, if uh, there is like a tennis match during my school, I'm gonna watch it and the lesson is not interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry if my one of my teachers hears that. Or like we sometimes we we focus on something different. Uh, so that's also like the problem we, or we have to um, like take care of. It's also how the technology is used. 
for example, I think like watching YouTube videos or like uh, playing games sometimes, playing Kahoot, that was like the most fun when I was I was a child children and how to learn like assessing knowledge. That's 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 great. But also there's some risk uh with technology and we also need to be careful of that about that. So giving access, of course, as you said, Alec, but also the problems that can collide with technology. I totally agree. <laughs> Yeah, that's an important perspective to also bring up. Okay, so going to the next question. Uh, I think we just there are like extra questions to what to like, what do you think there? Are, I call them additional questions. But what do you think, guys, of other like ways of learning, educating? For example, what do you guys think of homeschooling? I actually yeah, think that it has become so much uh, popular in Poland, at least, uh, but it has become a trend. And for me, it's fine. It's great that people can be homeschooled and get um, proper education in school uh, when you have some uh, disabilities or something like that. Um, but I am also convinced that um, homeschooling takes away a big part of your social life and um, people who are homeschooled just because they do not like other people and uh, they just cannot socialize um, it may be a problem um, because it isn't a rescue homeschooling isn't a rescue but um, it won't solve all of our problems, um, but it can be used in a good way. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting to point out. I think that um, it, it is very important that uh, for children with special needs, it does provide a huge advantage being able to be homeschooled. And it can also provide, um, you know, a less stressful environment. However, it's important to know that not all parents are qualified to be teachers and um, this can provide a lot of problem in the quality of a children's education. So I think that's also important to consider. Yeah, I think uh, for like smaller children, uh, it's better that they stay, for example, in school. But uh, I think if someone decides on their own that they want to get homeschooled, like if they go to high school and they think like, school is not for me. I have like a lot of friends. I can hang out with them. But for example, I learned faster on my own, um, like yeah, like learning on my own. I think that's like also uh, another um, uh, possibility to, 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 to just to be educated. And uh, I think having a lot of, of possibilities is also good for us. So we can choose uh, between like different programs and for example, also go into homeschooling. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Okay, so the next question is, how do different educational systems foster creativity and critical thinking skills among students? I actually may uh, start because I had a very interesting experience, in my opinion. Uh, a few months ago, I was in Denmark on a school trip. We were there um, in high school and university to spend our day like Denmark students. Uh, and I was actually shocked that... Um, the educational system there was requiring so much projects and um, group uh, things when they do not have tests uh, as much as we can. And they are mostly, um, they get most of their grades based on uh, the projects that they do in groups. So it was quite interesting for me. And I think that uh, I've also uh, read recently that in Finland it is also so popular uh, to encourage young people um, to solving problems by their own and encourages um, creativity in that way. 
Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with you completely. And also, yeah, same here. Uh, I and Alex, we can say a bit about that because we birth in IB program, which is a way indifferent that it it also has like critical thinking. It is, for example, the subject theory of knowledge, which is all about critical thinking. Yeah. Um, and uh, as you said, Martina, I think um, because I was in such school, like for my whole life, I was in private school and also in the uh, MYP and then in the IBTP program, projects was was what we we did a lot of projects and that would like that that's why for example i love canva because like creating and doing something in canva that sometimes for school i i could like spend hours doing one project <laughs> and it's what made me passionate so i think sometimes like um creativity some educational systems which are more like new they um they focus on this creativity critical thinking and some some programs do not do that i think in poland in some some places for sure it's not done but it also sometimes depends on the teacher as i said before teachers are like in in impact have have a really 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 big impact yes yeah i agree completely yeah, I think we just agree with each other. <laughs> that's, yeah. that, that's what we do. Okay, so as I mentioned, you guys, um, I was, uh, I am for, um, for my whole life in private schools, but do you think there are like major differences uh, between public and private school? That's also different like in Canada. So your opinion here, Alex, would be great. But I All think... Right. In Poland, in, it depends on the private school or the public school, but sometimes in public school, as I said, the curriculum is something different and sometimes teacher can change the bit, but also you, you need to pay tuition. So it's also only for those who can afford it. Uh, so also the, um, the, you, you are probably, I, I think I, um, I was and I am in a community that's like only people who can afford it. So also it's not the people for different backgrounds, which is also like, for example, a disadvantage of that. So what do you think, guys? Do you like see any differences between private schools? Do you like heard probably from your friends or or what's what's your experience here? To say from my experience, I've been in uh, public school my whole life. Um, I've had access to uh, the Kokuto program when I was in elementary and junior high, and I've had access to the IB program currently now and as I'm in high school. Uh, I don't have to really pay any extra tuition than the public school tuition. And as far as class sizes are concerned, while I know that a lot of times advantages for private schools can involve having that smaller class size for more focused education. My um, my biology class, for example, only has eight people in it because of the uh, IB program. It's not that popular in my school. And because of the lack of additional fees and my school also covers the cost for IB exams. So I think jealous. Like, I'm jealous. <laughs> Alex, do you pay yeah. tuition fees uh, for going to the public school uh there's like a standard fee that you have to pay every year but it's it's uh i i may be wrong on this but it is i believe you can apply for something to help afford it it's not um extraneous it's not like a huge fee it's uh yeah it's fairly affordable so everyone can access it oh that's interesting i think that. Okay. In Poland, we have a stereotype um, that people who go to the private school uh, are not learning at all. They are just paying for um, going to the school and they do not um, learning anything. They just pass because they pay. And I think <laughs> it's real hurtful for those like Maya uh, who really go to that uh, to that private school, um, but uh, actually want to learn something? Yeah, yeah, I think. But for example, I can say that 
even in our school when you pay you can get thrown out of school if you do something bad or you do not learn that's like not the problem that you pay you just school also cares about the exams and everything uh but also i think there um there are some like sometimes it depends just on the school so i think like also stigmatizing that this is a private school this is a public school sometimes it does not like make this difference I think like focusing on the teachers, on how the school be looks like, because if it's a new school built by the state, that's also can be like a great school with like looks and um some like stuff. I think what we like, like I like um, a lot, is that for example, when the teacher in our school uh, is not students, it's not who students want. Like she just. We had this one like thing that our uh, teacher was just bad at her job. So we wrote like a whole petition to our headmaster <laughs> and she like they said thank you to the teacher. So I think that also what's what's like great about public probably some only, but it's like that students maybe have some more influence, but it can also be a disadvantage if students are you know, more like I know the best. Uh, and there are a lot of, um, I think, <laughs> students who think they know the best, but it just depends also on the person and, and who they really are. I think also a major point is just cost. I was looking to apply for a, um, uh, to go to a private school with a scholarship before COVID hit and I couldn't do it anymore. But um and to live on the campus and attend the campus, it was $60,000 per year. And that is just an extraordinary amount, which it, it really shows that some students are not going to have this opportunity because there's only one scholarship. There are so many people who cannot afford that because that is an extreme amount of money. And it, it, it it's like there's the program they were offering was the AP program, which is offered at other public schools. So I think there's a point where you need to consider that while there are some benefits, it's not always fair, at least in Canada, because some people aren't able to afford that. Yeah, but like um, also there are like universities, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think in there, like for example, in Poland, a public universities, uh, you don't have to pay for them. So that's also a really great thing. But for example, like in United States, you have also pay, I think for public schools. So- yeah. So you don't for... have to pay for university? No, we don't you have to so? pay. Them. Are you serious? <laughs> no. <laughs> I have to pay so much. I'm going to be like $40,000 in debt four years later. This could be horrible. Oh my gosh. Oh. This yeah. It's a public school. Because in Poland, even at private universities, we do not have like so big uh, tuition fees. Yeah, they're like... It's just a small... Uh, amount sometimes if you like if you can afford it that you can a lot of people also choose private university because they also have for example younger like professors and you know for us younger professors sometimes means that he is like more speaks more our language but yeah we don't <laughs> in poland we don't have to pay for like uh for universities for public uh universities that's awesome I've also okay. heard that in Denmark, that's just like a fun fact, but uh, I've also heard that in Denmark, um, when you're uh, a resident there, you do not have to pay for university, but you also uh, got money from the government for just attending university. And if you are an international student who wants to study there, um, you just have to work um, aside with uh, the university and you also get the government uh, fees. I think that's... that's... Sorry? What? Can you repeat, Alex? Sorry. <laughs> that's where? Sorry? Denmark. 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 <laughs> Guys, I might be a planner <laughs> Yeah, like like I was actually you could that do that. I was like I think that I wanted to go for them to study like abroad, but it's it's the language. Sometimes you know you don't know mm, what level yeah. of English will be, uh, and uh, learning in that uh, like what's the language in German? I don't know. Uh, 
yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to call it. Uh, and In English, uh, yes. You want to study in English and sometimes there are not a lot of programs. And if there are mm -hmm. programs there, for example, on private universities, which you have to pay quite a lot in euros, for example. Um, yeah, so I think we should go to the next question, really. Yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, so how does school influence habits that can be taken beyond the school setting? What do you guys think? I think uh, that, yeah, that's like school um, does like impact you a lot. I think for me personally, it's just like, uh, I think that I behave a lot of like my uh, classmates <laughs> and some thinking uh, I have from my classmates or from my teachers because they're like um, another perspective for me, which I don't have, for example, in my parents. And sometimes like uh, some habits, uh, which I do what I say, it's also taken from my school, what we learn for the curriculum. Uh, for example, uh, I think the IB puts a bit, uh, the IB program puts a lot of pressure on climate change and like being uh, sustainable, being ec eco and stuff like that. And I am the person who are going to tell you that please do not buy that or like I'm eco freak a little bit <laughs> right now. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, for example, the habit I took from my school setting. Yeah. Uh, I, think I think that's a bit. Think okay. That... Oh, sorry. Alex, <laughs> go, go with question. it. Go with it, Alex. Are you sure? Because like I interrupted you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I interrupted you. As I said, go okay, for it. Okay, so I'm next. Okay. <laughs> so I think that uh, for school, it's a lot of the case of like what you you get out what you put in. So like um, studying for hours, waking up early, avoiding distractions to like maintain a high grade. It can be annoying, yeah. Like, I'll be the first one to tell you that, yes, it can be annoying studying for, like, four hours straight. But does it prepare you for future? Yes, it, it develops discipline. You are able to develop the skills to succeed in later life. Um, you're able to, or, uh, your time management skills with, like, the organizing deadlines, adhering to these deadlines. I think that, well... I think we can all universally as students agree that it sucks sometimes we're going to be able to be more successful because we we develop these habits and we're going to be able to take them beyond the school setting yes that's what i was going to say about organizing uh, your day and uh, how you study what times do you do it um yes i think that's the most important skills uh maybe also um a habit of um, just preparing for a stressful situations. Uh, I think it is quite important because in life we will have stressful, uh, stressful situations, uh, not just uh, around exams, tests, uh, but also in work, also with our social psych uh, circle. Um, it is quite important, and I think that uh, school teaches us how to deal with it maybe not how but it is just preparing us yeah, yeah i agree yeah for sure also what i wanted to say um that um can you hear me guys yes, yes. oh okay that's great <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I thought that was some problem but okay I want to say that, like, to sum up what you just said, like, school is not, it's it's like school of life, uh, in a way, like, in school, it's like a preparation, preparation a bit for, for the life we're gonna, we're gonna have. Uh, but moving to a bit, like, I think, important questions, or, or, like, more major questions, um, how for you, like, guys, for example, education connect with tolerance, diversity, and uh, equality? So I think when we look at uh, the gender equality when considering education, there are 129 million girls around the globe that are out of school right now. And it, it's, it provides a definite lack of opportunity for those girls that I think definitely needs to be bridged because there could be so many promising and potentially 
extraordinary students in that crowd of girls who aren't who don't have the access to the school and they can want to but they still can't so i think that's incredibly important to address that yeah yes i agree well also when i was thinking about the question I think that, as you said, Alex, there is gender inequality, especially that young girls, I think, in some countries are getting married earlier uh, or they are, uh, uh, they, for example, uh, if parents want to invest in their children's education, they're going to invest still uh, in the boys' education and not the girls. Uh, if in some countries, for example, it's like universities need to be paid. But there are also like some um uh, like uh, some um things that also stigmatize like black boys uh from uh, getting like a proper education for example that they have to uh go to you know have to work because you know there are strong boys they have to go to work so for example they skip universities uh there are also there is child labor as a problem there is like gang violence or like uh, recruitment into armed groups for example going to military uh, or, or other stuff like also for for girls as i said it's also like poverty and um yeah there are like a lot of problems with it but also i think um regarding like diversity it's also important to learn in a diverse uh, community with a background of cultures with uh, different also perspectives uh, with for example discussion discussions at cl in, in classes about different problems because that's how we uh, how people are becoming uh, open minded and like see the horror world in different uh, also colors and not only like it's the same yeah, education is so important because if we're aware of a problem, we can work towards fixing that problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I have nothing to add. I think <laughs> you just said it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are moving to our last question of the whole podcast. What is it? It is not the last one. It is not? I think it's the last one. Oh. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, because we did Maybe one, I right? just... <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry, I skipped around I just the skipped one. <laughs> That's okay, <laughs> my bad. Um, so the last one I had um a right to how to say it? I Re do not know. It's last just, but not least. Last Anyone? but not least. Yeah. <laughs> what steps can we uh, can be taken to ensure equal access to education globally? I think that's a really hard question to do right now, mm -hmm. but I think like promoting, talking about it or like also I think the changes needs to be made from above. So like governments need to impose action and do that. So, um, but probably there are also like, I know, financial support for some uh, families uh, which cannot send like maybe also scholarships. That's a way like increasing scholarships and uh, making the education more like um, uh, probable for the, for the girls or even for uh, poorer families or um, yeah or also as we said like and sometimes children live like far away from their school so also like distance learning it could be a way like online learning maybe it's not that uh, um, it has some disadvantages, but it also can help students learn when they're like moving, for example, around the world or they're like uh, far away from the school. Mm -hmm. I think uh, another way we can ensure equal access is um, kind of just financially. I think there should be a lot more work financially done because it's like financial support for students. So I think more scholarships should be available um, public funding grants, uh, it will, because then that way we're able to allow all students this, um, regardless of economic background, equal opportunities that they will be able to use to achieve success. Um, I think another thing that is important, it's just like global education. So people can understand there are problems in this because a lot of people I'm sure right now aren't thinking anything about, uh, a lack of education worldwide because they're currently in their education. I think if we educate more people on how there is so 
so many people who aren't in schools or who have access to a school, then we're going to be able to work towards fixing that. It'll highlight the problem so we can understand that this is a problem and it's impacting so many kids worldwide. Yes, yeah. I agree. Maybe we should also, um, I mean, not we, but the government should also concentrate on international uh, organizations and non-governmental organizations that uh, can actually help with the problem of um, not being, um, not uh, education not being um, accessible to everybody in uh, in the world. So I think it is a worldwide problem and we should concentrate not just in our uh, communities, but also like in a bigger uh, point of view. Yeah, 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 100%. And also because teachers are like, you know, important, also like giving finances to like, sends people to school to encourage them also to work as teachers because sometimes in even in the house or like i don't know in school like there should be just a person sometimes to teach or like uh also the technology it can also like give uh possibilities to for children to learn on their own like in the house it's just with a tablet for example Yes, yeah. and we should also, uh, as we talk about technology, we should also concentrate about how many people do not have proper resources just because they do not speak English. Um, mm. And they can't have proper resources uh, just because um, they do not have access to technology Firstly, and secondly, even if they do have access to technology, uh, just because we understand something in English, it does not mean that this document or this resource will be translated to their language. And I think that is a big problem around the world. Yeah, so also what you said, like I can remember they are so also learning languages uh, is a way of, um, you know, learning languages is, is a way of also giving access so if children then learn like english or learn other languages it's easier for them to learn in also the other uh, line or watch videos or like around the world if you learn english or like i don't know um some of like french which is also or like spanish or like portuguese it's also mm -hmm. sometimes important and can give you access to education you don't have where you live yeah I think that just about wraps it up. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really fun. Thank you, guys. Yeah, for thank you so it much. It was amazing. And thank you, everyone who is listening that probably. I don't know if the girls from uh, Girls Grow Already Team High. <laughs> and <laughs> if you, uh, like, made it to the end, we are so happy. Uh, we, uh, we made it quite long, but that's who we are and thank you everybody for listening thank you guys for thank you for this thank work you so thank you wonderful time and i think that's 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 it <laughs>